Hey there, it's Steve from Serious Keto, and this is episode number five of the Not So Serious Keto video podcast. In this video, we will be talking a little keto in the news. I'll give you my impressions of the documentary The Magic Pill. I'll answer a couple of frequently asked questions, and this might be kind of an ongoing segment that I do, because it seems like I get a lot of similar questions, and I'll just pick a couple every episode and address them. And then I want to revisit a topic from last week, which is all about comments and recipe requests, because I don't think I articulated it as well as I wanted to, and I'd like to clarify just a little bit. So with that, let's get started with keto in the news. Now, this particular story has shown up in my Google News Feed three times in the last two days. The original story came from a Fox affiliate in Charlotte, but now I see the exact same article popping up from Fox affiliates in Houston and Arizona, and I'm sure this is going to keep happening. The story is about a man who was fired from his job at American Airlines for failing a DUI test because he was in ketosis. Now, I'm not actually going to mention this gentleman's name uh, out of respect. If you want to look up the article, you can see his name. I'll just call him Mr. Flight Attendant. Here's the article. I'm not going to read it all. I'll read some snippets in my best news reading voice. An American Airlines worker is fighting for his job back. He says he switched to the popular keto diet and that it ended up costing him his job. Mr. Flight Attendant is now in the fight of his life as he takes on the Department of Transportation and American Airlines to get his job back. Mr. Flight Attendant had been a flight attendant with American Airlines since 2012 when he was fired last year. He says it's because he blew a .05 on a breathalyzer. Now, as you read further, it talks about him also failing a breathalyzer test back in 2013. And that was, in fact, alcohol. But this time, he's saying that it's because he was on the keto diet that he blew a .05. This article has the faint aroma of BS to me for a couple of reasons. First off, I looked up what the DUI limit is in South Carolina, and it's 0 .08. It's 0 .05 if you are a commercial driver. So if he were driving a truck or a bus or something like that, then it would be 0 .05. But for just a regular civilian, it's 0 .08. So how is it that this counted as a DUI? That's my first question, and it's not answered in this article. The second is, and I'm just speaking as myself here, if I hadn't been drinking and I failed a breathalyzer test, I would ask to be taken to a hospital and have a blood test done. Even at my own expense, that makes far more sense than to have to go through getting an attorney and all of this jazz if you had a DUI. But even beyond that, let's say that a field breathalyzer did detect the acetone or isopropyl alcohol on your breath that sometimes people get when they're in a state of ketosis, and supposedly some breathalyzers can't distinguish between that and actual ethanol or you know legit alcohol, you still wind up going back to the police station where they perform a test called an infrared spectroscopy on you. And that is a far more expensive piece of equipment that can distinguish between isopropyl and ethanol alcohol. So a lot of the elements in this story just don't add up to me. And it just, it feels like one more of these sort of, uh, maybe fear-mongering is too strong of a word, but the sort of every week article that we see about some sort of side effect of keto. It's just some sort of general now social thing that they want to try and stigmatize keto, whether that's keto breath or keto crotch, or now you can't drive when you're on keto because you're going to get a DUI. I would find this all just laughable were it not for the fact that there is some percentage of people that are going to look at these things like keto breath, keto crotch, well, all these side effects, keto DUI, and say, you know, I don't think I'm going to go keto. Maybe it's a small amount. But it's just, it feels like it's one of those things that just through the media, it's one more brick in the wall that they're just trying to do anything they can do 
to turn people off of keto. I'm going to perform a little test here just for fun. I have a breathalyzer. This is not an expensive breathalyzer. I'm sure it costs far less than the models that your typical officer has in his or her vehicle. I think if a device is gonna fail and give me a false positive, I think it would be more likely to be something like this than what's in a squad car. But first, I'll check my ketones with my handy dandy Keto Mojo. Counting down, and we have, I don't know if you can see that, a 1.0. So I am in nutritional ketosis right now, not optimal ketosis because I'm not over 1.5, but I am in ketosis. I am spilling ketones. And now the breathalyzer. Zero point zero zero. Nothing. So I don't know. Maybe I'm not in high enough ketosis. Maybe this whole thing is just sort of BS. I'm not sure. Anyhow, that's not a scientific test by any means. Just sort of uh, satisfying my own curiosity. But the article itself, the news story, there's just, there's enough elements in it that don't add up, enough unanswered questions that I really kind of consider it bad reporting. And I think you can just sort of throw this into the bucket of more sensationalized keto news that's just trying to turn people away from keto. That's my thoughts anyway. After I reviewed the documentary, Fat, a documentary, a couple of episodes ago, some people had asked me if I had seen The Magic Pill on Netflix, and I hadn't, so I watched that yesterday, and I enjoyed it. I think it is a considerably better documentary than Fat was. Some of the things that I liked about it, as opposed to Fat, first it just felt a lot more balanced to me. It was first and foremost about a number of people who were changing their lives through a ketogenic diet. So less sort of that celebrity focus that Vinny, whatever his name was, and, and Fat was all about. It, it was about people. Because of the, the different people that were in this, we had some Aboriginal Australians. You had some parents with autistic children. You had a, a woman who had breast cancer. You had a couple of uh, older women that have had chronic pain and diabetes and medication issues. And there was another woman who had asthma, and I think there was a, uh, there may have been a couple of others in there, but there's bound to be someone that you can identify with, and, and their story is going to resonate with you, I think, on a more personal level. For me, it was about the dad and his autistic daughter. I think anyone that, that has children, that's going to hit them, you know, square in the chest. Just the, the difficulty that he went through with that. I mean, I just got a little bit teary just thinking about it. And um, what, what an incredible challenge it must be to have a special needs child. So I really enjoyed that. I enjoyed the balance in the doctors and medical professionals that they showed. It seemed very, very even. There was nobody that was getting an inordinate amount of time, I think. There were a few people I think that they certainly could have spent more time with. Uh, there was Dr. William Davis, who wrote Wheat Belly. I'm pretty sure he's actually from Milwaukee, too, so, uh, you know, kind of local celebrity. You had Dr. Andreas Einfeld from Diet Doctor. Pete Evans is also in this. And Pete Evans, just as a side note, I think may be the handsomest guy in the world. I look at Pete Evans and I feel less attractive. <laughs> He is just that good looking. The thing that I like about him too is when he listens to people, you see this empathy out of him that is just, it's amazing. He, it's like he's hanging on your every word. And I just think, I think that's super cool. I wish that were a skill that I had. Also, you have Joel Salatin, who I love. I love this guy. I read his book, Folks That Ain't Right. I think I had originally seen him in Food Incorporated. I really like this guy. I like his approach to sustainable farming and treating the planet well and treating animals well. And I just think he's, you know, a super cool dude. I wish we could get rid of these CAFOs, these industrial farms, and move to his 
sustainable model. And then there's a significant chunk also spent on Dr. Tim Noakes. Dr. Noakes gave some dietary advice in Twitter recommending that somebody move to a low-carb, high-fat diet, and then was brought up on trial in South Africa for unprofessional conduct. And you watch the footage from this trial, and it's an absolute witch hunt. As you watch that, it's hard not to feel a little bit of fear. Fear that big pharma and the big processed food industries have the lawyers and the money and the power to come after keto. They have the power to scare doctors. They have the power potentially even to come after a channel like this or Thomas DeLauer or Dr. Barry or whomever. They could go after Jason Fung. I mean, all of us, I think, potentially, if we got big enough and threatening enough, we could find ourselves on the receiving end of something like Dr. Noakes did. I hope that's not the case. I hope I'm just, you know, being paranoid about that. So that whole trial aspect, that was very interesting. It was very interesting to watch all of these different and very disparate groups. I mean, in terms of their, their lives, their gender, their race, their geographical location, all benefiting from a low-carb, high-fat diet. And I found that at an hour and a half, this movie clipped along at a great pace. I, it got done and I was kind of surprised that it was done, as opposed to Fat, a documentary, which felt padded to get to an hour and a half. So I like that. Of course, they took some shots at Ansel Keys, which always makes me happy. <laughs> I guess if I had any minor complaints about the magic pill, I think that because they show all of these different people and these different stories, while there will be one or two that really resonate with you, there's likely going to be a couple that you just can't identify with and may find yourself in some of these longer sequences with them getting perhaps a little bit bored. I also would have liked to have seen them come back to these people that had these incredible improvements, getting off of insulin, getting off of medications, the improvements in, in the autistic children. I would have loved to have seen this documentary return back to them six months later. And who knows, maybe there will be a sequel or something. It was so great to see the progress that these people made in just eight weeks. I wanted to see more. I wanted to, you know, come back, show me, did they keep getting better? One last thing that just also didn't seem quite right to me, at the end, they ended the documentary with a song, and it was sung by the, the woman who had asthma and got all better. And it just, it felt a little bit out of place, having a song at the end of a documentary. It just something about it, it felt just strangely awkward to me. Kind of like when you're, when you're at a Mexican restaurant and they've got a mariachi band, and they come and they play table side, and you're just like, okay, this feels kind of weird. Is this going to end soon? That's kind of how I felt. It's probably a horrible, horrible metaphor, but it just, it felt really out of place, and I kind of hoped that that song would end quickly, and then we could get on with whatever was left in the documentary. I would highly recommend this movie. I think it's a great movie for anyone that's on keto to watch. I think if you've got a friend or relative that's maybe on the fence that you think we can convert to keto, I would far rather they watch this movie than Fat, a documentary. This movie actually lowered my impression of Fat. So I would probably now give Fat a 6 out of 10, and I would give The Magic Pill an 8 out of 10. So, thumbs up, Magic Pill. And with that, we will take a brief commercial break. Hopefully just one commercial. You might get two. Hopefully you can skip the ads and come right back. See you in a second. So I'm not sure if this is going to be an ongoing segment for the show, but it seems that there are certain questions that I get asked on a fairly regular basis. We could say even frequently. They are frequently asked questions of Steve. So let me answer a couple right now. I get this one at least once a week. How tall are you? I'm 5'9". I guess maybe that helps you figure out was losing 75 pounds a big deal or, or not a big deal. At one point I think I was 5'10", but Gravity in time has its way of beating you down, and now I'm 5'9". 
I'd love to be like six feet tall. I think that would be cool, but I'm not, and there's nothing I can do about it. So you do your best with the hand that's been dealt you. Five foot nine. The other appearance-related question that I get is, do you dye your hair? And I think this came from some of the earlier pictures that I showed pre-transformation, where I'm pretty gray. I actually used to dye my hair. I started going gray in my early 30s, and that just felt way too early for me. So I started dyeing my hair. And then, I don't know when I stopped dyeing my hair, but started looking a lot more gray. And then, Control GX shampoo came out, and I started using that to take a little bit of the gray out. Certainly, if you see me out in sunlight or when I'm not using any sort of like hair sculpting stuff to try and control all my colics, it does look more gray. But interestingly, I got a comment from one of my viewers, a woman, who said that she believes that her hair, since she went keto, has started to get less gray. I decided that I would sort of test this out, and I quit using the Control GX shampoo a couple of weeks ago and had a haircut. So what you're seeing is essentially my color now. And yeah, there's some gray here in the sides, but to me, it looks like I'm getting less gray. I don't know. If, if that's the case, then one more awesome thing for keto. I guess we'll find out eventually when it gets warm enough that I'm outside and it's summer or something and I'm getting hit full on with sunlight and if I don't have any sort of hair product in, that'll be the real test. But it certainly seems to me like my hair is getting a little less gray, which, you know, awesome. In last week's podcast, I talked about some of the various comments and recipe requests and direct messages and things like that that I get. And I wanted to revisit that just because I want to make sure that no one misunderstands my, my thoughts or feelings. First off, I am amazed and I love the quantity of comments that show up in the comment sections of my videos. It really makes me feel like we have a community here together. And I especially love it when I see you all interacting with one another, not just asking me stuff, but helping each other out. It really, it makes me feel great. It is tough for me to get to all of them. I try my best to read them all. YouTube does not have, so far as I can tell, a great system for comment management. Some comments show up in the upper left-hand corner, you know, where you got the little notification bell. I'll click on that and I'll see comments. But it seems like only a fraction of comments show up for me up there. If I go into the Creator Studio and then look at comments, I will see comments in chronological order, but oftentimes not replies that some of you leave for each other, only stuff that's directed to me. Also, I find that I can only scroll back so far in these comments before the scroll bar on my browser, no matter what browser I use, gets all wonky and it starts to jerk in the screen around and things like that. So I find that I almost need to be looking at comments on an hourly basis if I don't want to miss any. And that's a lot of time to be spending on comments. As I mentioned last week, if you were to add up the total number of comments I get across my 100 plus videos, plus Instagram, plus Facebook, plus the direct messaging functions in each of these, and some emails, and the comments that get left out on my website, conservatively 300 a day. And then on days when I'm releasing a video, it's not uncommon to have 500 comments over the course of a day across all of those different areas. And I do my best to try and read them. So I want you to know that I appreciate them. I try and read them. Uh, I respond when I can. Realistically, I do obsess over the comments and I spend too much time in them and too much time probably trying to reply as often as I can to everybody that I can. And there's probably going to be less of that. But I want you to know that I do read the comments. I appreciate them and I enormously appreciate when all of you interact with each other. The other thing I talked about is in comments and direct messages and so on, the number of recipe requests that I get or actual recipes that are sent to me. And I appreciate those as well. 
I think it's so great, especially when people are developing their own recipes and sending them to me, because that's what I want this channel to be about, is people feeling excited and empowered about keto cooking. And if you're sending me a recipe, that to me is proof that you're having fun in the kitchen. You are experimenting and coming up with your own stuff, which is great. To give you an idea of how far behind I am in trying out recipes that are sent to me, this weekend, I got around to a couple of recipes that were sent to me back in early October of last year. So I am a solid three to four months away from trying out your recipe if you were to send it to me today. So if you do send me a recipe, just know that I'll take a look at it. If it's something that looks pretty cool, I'll give you some feedback on it. If you want me to try it out, though, it could be a long time before I get to it. Which then brings me to recipe requests, which I also get a lot, a lot of. And back when I first started this channel, getting all of these requests was great because basically I had a feeder channel of ideas that I could just start making recipes for and videos for. I have a Microsoft OneNote file broken into a bunch of different tabs for things like chaffles or corn dog maker or special appliance requests or special dietary needs and so on. And I can tell you that if I didn't get another request, I would still have enough material here for probably the next year or so. So I'm not telling you not to give me suggestions, not to make requests, but what I am telling you, kind of like the, with the, the comments and the recipes, is it could be a while until I get there, unless it's something that you're requesting that was already on my list and I'm already getting ready to do. Now, one of the things that I'm looking to do to perhaps better manage some of the requests that are given to me and recipes that are requested is possibly creating some sort of forum on my website, on SeriousKeto.com, that would allow registered users to then exchange ideas, make requests from one another, etc. Or I may somehow roll that into channel memberships, where if people wanted to do some sort of a recipe exchange or have their particular request maybe escalated a little bit higher on my list, perhaps that would be one of the perks of channel memberships when I set those up. And I will talk more about channel membership on the next podcast, but I think it's going to work out pretty well. It's one of those things where if you don't want it, no worries. You're not going to notice any difference in the channel. But if you do want to contribute to the channel and you do want some extra little perks, behind the scenes videos, things like that, ultimately what channel memberships will allow me to do is to give back to the people that want to support the channel. Right now, with Patreon, people are giving me monthly donations. Some people are giving me a dollar, some people are giving me five dollars, ten dollars. One gentleman's even giving me twenty-five dollars a month, which is incredible that uh, he values my content that much, but he said he was spending that much easily once a week taking the family out for fast food, and now he doesn't have to do that anymore. But for my patrons on Patreon, I wasn't really able to give them much of anything in return for their donation. Whereas with channel memberships, I'm able to do that. So don't look at channel memberships as me being greedy. It's not about extorting content. It's not about me eliminating content from people that don't donate, but rather it's about me being able to give some additional perks as my way of saying thank you to those people who do want to donate to the channel. But like I said, I'll talk more about that next week. That's it for this episode. Thanks for watching or listening.